Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and uh, it's just the two of us, and that's okay because we are here, and we are ready to do this thing, and it's going to be good. This is Stuff You Should Know. That's right. Wading into political waters. Yep. No way around it. No way around it. What does that D.C. license plate say? Taxation without representation. That says it all. (laughs) It really does. I love it because it's so subversive, you know? That's right. We're talking about D.C. statehood and why the District of Columbia is not a state Mm -hmm. when they have 700,000 roughly people living there, Mm -hmm. about 250,000 of which were born and raised there, Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet they don't get the benefits of statehood. Yeah. which we'll talk about for reasons that are kind of uh, terrible, not too relevant, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you aren't aware, if you live in D.C., you uh, you have some voting rights, but mostly um, you are very much limited or restricted as far as, like, what you're allowed to do to participate in democracy, at least compared to other states, right? And all of this is like because of a layer, layer after layer after layer of rules and laws and regulations that basically prevent DC residents from voting or participating like other other um, residents of other states. Um, and so this idea that like wait this isn't right has been something that people have been talking about for a very long time, and yet we still can't reach this finish line to make DC the fifty first state. Um, which a lot of people, including most of the people who live in D.C., want. They want to become the 51st state. They want to be a state. They want to be treated like a state. And they just can't quite get it to the finish line. But it's possible, Chuck, that we're we're close, closer than ever, actually. Closer than ever, but still not too close, if you ask me. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. So let's talk about yeah. how D.C. was even established and why all of this is, is like this hodgepodge of weird laws and rules and where it came from. Yeah, so we didn't have a capital as a country at first uh, for about, um, I guess, from 1776 to 89. Mm-hmm. The Continental Congress met in different places. They met in Philly, of course. They met in Maryland some. They met in New York City some. They even met in New Jersey some, mm-hmm. believe it or not. Yeah. And in 1787, in the uh, the Philadelphia Convention, they wrote the Constitution and said, you know, that's really kind of beefed up the federal government and said, we need some place that's like clearly ours that we will meet that is permanent. And it was written right there in the Constitution. Yeah. uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Yes. And um, exactly where they were going to put this new capital was a huge debate. Like, everybody just presumed it would be someplace like New York or Philadelphia, where it was already, you know, the populations were very established and large, and where they'd already written the Constitution, and where a lot of the early founding fathers were from. Um, But the southern states said, hey, man, we don't want the capital all the way up there in New York or in Pennsylvania. We need it somewhere that's a little closer to the middle of this country, this string of 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard. So they came up with what's called the Compromise of 1790, which said, okay, we'll place this capital further south toward you guys. But you have to say that the colonial um, debts and obligations that were accrued during the Revolutionary War— we we get to move those over to the um to the federal government's responsibility because we these northern colonies are swimming in debt and we just can't pay them off. So one of the first things we have to do when we establish this country is laden it with revolutionary war debt. Right, uh, and with the Residence Act, they said you know we literally need land mm-hmm. like physical space. So mm-hmm. Maryland, Virginia, pony up. Uh, you got to give up each a little bit. Uh, to create this area, and um, I think they eventually, not I think, I know, they eventually got back Alexandria, Virginia in 1846, Mm -hmm. but initially that was a part of the the tranche of land, and sort of the very, I think from the very beginning, they weren't a state because of something that happened that kind of feels a little more contemporary uh, of the past couple of recent years. 
uh, the Phil- the Pennsylvania mutiny of 1783, mm-hmm. when these veterans, hundreds of veterans, stormed Congress and said, you know, this is what we want. They were angry. We want back pay. We want this and that. Mm-hmm. And the Pennsylvania Executive Council would not send the state militia to protect Congress. And they had to move to New Jersey temporarily. And so they were like, this is not good. We need to be able to be in charge of our own um, defense, really. Right. And so we need a, a federal land that is not a state, so we can have our own uh, our own defense uh, system, our own soldiers. Yeah, defense they, system. <laughs> they just saw that if it ever came down to you know a federal versus a state kind of situation again, that they couldn't rely on a state militia, so the capital couldn't be associated or affiliated with the state. It had to be a stateless capital that was its own territory. It so made sense. It it definitely did. Um, and, and it was all because of that Pennsylvania mutiny of 1783, because those war veterans were owed back pay and they were mad about it and were chasing Congress all over the country for it. So, um, so that's why D.C. was stateless to begin with, like that, so that the federal government could have its own jurisdiction over this, this area, over the capital. That's right. And uh, in 1800, uh, Congress set up there in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. and like I said, Alexandria is part of it first. Georgetown was and still is, and they were, you know, they were port towns, so there was a lot going on there, but for the first um, several decades, D.C. was pretty rural uh, and didn't really start growing a lot, uh, and we have some population breakdowns, but it was really post-Civil War yeah. is when uh, the population boom happened there. I think in 1800, there was 8,000 people there. 1860, 70,000. 1880, 175,000. That's a big jump. Yeah, and these are you know people that work for the government, and these are also uh, free people now that came up from the South, set up residence there. And so D.C. for many, many years had a majority black population, and kind of right away, uh, the federal government was like, well, that won't do either. Yes, and so the reason that they were not okay with it was because, well, at first, so people in D.C. have been agitating for um, what's called home rule, which is just basically you're allowed to self-determine your own government. You can elect your own officials. They can pass laws. Uh, other people can't, like out, other people in the country can't tell you that your laws uh, are invalid. Um, it's just basically the, the the right to sovereignty that any state holds, right? So people have been interested in that in D.C. since the outset. But as you said earlier, it was a really rural and small population for a while. So it didn't really matter as much because it affected so few people. But as the population grew, it became more and more of a pressing issue until um, they finally said in, I think, 1867, you know what, you're, you're, you're totally right. Like, we should, we should let D.C. residents vote. And they um, passed an act that said everybody in D.C. can vote. And by saying everybody in D.C., or I should say every man in D.C. can vote, um, they were, f- for the first time in American history, enfranchising uh, black men to vote. Like, there, there had never been a law that allowed black men to vote in the history of the country to that point, and that was the first one that was ever passed. And so starting in 1867, uh, for a full three long years, um, black men were allowed to vote in D.C. for um, things like federal, federal, federal government positions, like the president and vice president. Right. And when I said that won't do, that's what I was talking about. They uh, quickly realized that you have a large city or, you know, a larger city now Mm -hmm. that is being controlled. You know, there's a lot of political power with black people for the first time. Mm -hmm. And this alarmed them. And so they said, all right, we're going to replace this with uh, a federally appointed commission. Yeah. And they did that really quickly. And it was exactly for that reason. It was to uh, re-disenfranchise black people. Yeah, there's a famous quote from a senator named John Tyler Morgan who was describing it years later why why they repealed that law and appointed that f- that federal commission to rule the city. He said, and I'm sorry for this, everybody, after the Negroes came into the district, it became necessary to deny the right of suffrage entirely to every human being, to burn down the barn to get rid of the rats, the rats being the Negro population and the barn being the government, of the District of Columbia. So yeah, what he's he saying... Sa- he said it out loud. 
He did and wrote it down. Like it's in quotes there. So he, um, it, what he's saying is, is that to keep black people from voting in D.C., they had to remove the voting rights of everybody. Um, and that's what they did. And what's crazy is, is that's how it has generally remained for uh, 150 years now for basically the same reason, unfortunately. Yeah, it was uh, from the 1800s until 1973. Like, I was born mm -hmm. and alive mm -hmm. when Washington, D.C. was still a territory that had a governor and a ruling council that the president appointed. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have a single uh, delegate to Congress, uh, and but that they were not given a congressional vote. So there was a delegate that could do the things that delegates do. Uh, they could even introduce articles. Yeah. Uh, but they can't even vote on their own articles. No, no, they can. They can be on committees and all that. Like almost everything that a house member can do, a, congre a congressional member could do, but just not vote. It's a non-voting delegate. And so in that way, like, yes, you had somebody who could advocate for D.C., but the, the, the people of D.C. couldn't elect somebody who could go vote on their behalf in the House of Representatives. Right. And that's just the House. They have nobody and never have had a single representative in the Senate. So the only representation that D.C. Have is, has is a single non-voting member of the House of Representatives, and that's it. Yeah, like constituents without a real say mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It gets even far, far worse than that, you know, because I'm sure people are like, well, come on. You know, how much does that affect these people, really? Um, well, we're going to explain exactly how it affects them. But one of the big ways if it, it stands out to me is that when um, the Home Rule Act was passed in 1973 that said, okay, you guys can elect your own mayor and you can elect your own city council, bully for you. There's this thing that we have to, to tell you about, though. It's not all, you know, great. Every single law that gets passed by you in your town is subject to congressional review. It doesn't actually become law until Congress says that your laws that you came up with and passed yourselves are okay. And that means that any congressperson, any House member from anywhere in the country who is offended by one of your laws, who takes an issue with one of your laws, can strike that law down basically single-handedly by attaching a rider to your annual budget. And so if you don't like that rider, well, then you, you can do without it, but you have to do without the money that makes up about 25% of your operating budget every year. That's the kind of like draconian yeah. rule that Congress holds over D.C. to this day. Yeah, and this is why, and you know, unfortunately this does wade into politics and we'll get into that more later, but like it, it is kind of purely for partisan politics why D.C. is not a state at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, the ironies are pretty rich here in that, um, generally, uh, Republicans do not want D.C. to become a state, um, but they're also the same party who decries government overreach sure. and states' states' rights. Yeah. And I guess they'll say, well, yeah, but it's not a state, but it is certainly government overreach when you have the local people of a, ter or of a, of a district voting their, for their own laws that their constituents want, right. but the federal government can override those. And again, you might say, like, what laws? Who cares? What, what's the problem? How are these people actually really harmed with that? Well, there's actually, like, a, a lot of laws that D.C. has passed that Congress has either dragged its feet on or overturned that have actually harmed people. Um, D.C. had a needle exchange program to try to slow the spread of HIV, um, and it was overturned by Congress in, in 1998 and was not allowed to happen again until 2007. And it turns out that when that was finally allowed to start up again, the uh, HIV infection rates in the city, and by the way, D.C. had one of the highest rates of HIV after its needle exchange program was, was banned by Congress. Yeah. Um, its HIV rates dropped by 70%, and an estimated 120 people were prevented from uh, being infected with HIV in just two years after the needle program was allowed to, to start up again in 2007. There's also ones on abortion access, COVID-19, they got the short end of the stick as far as funds go. Um, and then there's another one where uh, they tried to repeal their sodomy law, which outlawed sex between men back in 1981. And Congress didn't let it actually go through until 1993. Wow. 
There's just been a lot of stuff where basically if you have somebody in Congress who doesn't like the idea of D.C., the people of D.C., having um, legalized marijuana or being able to use taxpayer money for abortions, like D.C. doesn't get to do that because a rider gets attached to their budget and they have to they have to take it. And that COVID thing you were talking about, they um, every U.S. state got one point two five billion dollars in aid. But Congress cut that in half for D.C., even though they had, well, first of all, they're like, well, we're bigger than Vermont uh, and like one one other state too, right? Wyoming or? Yep. And they're almost the same size as Alaska, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Delaware population-wise. Yeah. And they were, I think, had more confirmed COVID cases at the time than 19 other states, mm-hmm. yet they got half the aid just, just because. Yes. So it's it's mind numbing and crazy, and if you like, just put yourself in the position of somebody who's a like interested in the political process and lives in D.C. and the idea that your city can pass a law, huge like with huge support. I think their marijuana legalization um, law passed with sixty five percent support of voters, and somebody from Arizona could come along and be like, "Nope, you're not doing that." That law doesn't go through. I'm attaching that as a rider to your your annual budget. How out, outrage-inducing would that be? You know, how, how frustrating would yeah. it be at the very least? So, yes, it, it actually is harmful um, to, the, to the democracy of Washington, D.C. and their, their self-determination and their ability for home rule, um, the situation as it stands right now. All right, well, let's take a break. I think it's pretty clear where we stand here. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about the Electoral College, just that little thing, right after this. Burning stuff with Joshua and Charles, stuff you should know. <laughs> All right. So uh, people have been allowed to vote in Washington, D.C. for elections, for presidential national elections for a long time now. Uh, In 1961, they ratified the uh, ratified ratified the 23rd Amendment Mm -hmm. to the Constitution that was specifically for uh, D.C. electoral college votes in the presidential election. That was when they started to be able to vote for president, vote at all. That's right. So, so f- f- 60, 60 years is how long the residents of D.C. have been able to vote. Yeah, I mean, when I said quite a while, I didn't mean on the, like, the beginning of time scale, just sort of. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, I didn't know if you were being facetious or not. No, but. no, no. I mean, for many decades now, but not, yeah, it's, I guess in that context, it's, it's an outrage for sure. And so that, tw- that, that 23rd Amendment, that's the whole purpose of the 23rd Amendment yes. is to basically say, yes, D.C. can now vote in presidential elections and they can contribute electors. Um, but they can never have more electors than the number of electors that the least populous state in the United States has. Like, doesn't matter how many people, D.C. could swell to, well, it probably couldn't handle it, but right. it could swell to the size of a, a two million uh, population, and, and it doesn't matter, you get your three electors. Right, and it's always going to be three at the minimum because your number of electors are based on the representation you have in the in the House and the Senate. So you always, every state has two senators, and every state has at least one congressperson. And D.C. probably would always still have one congressperson anyway. That's how many Alaska has and Vermont and Delaware. Like these are, they're, they're, it's just based on population. So they will probably always have three electors. Um, And so those electors, ever since the, I believe, the 1964 election, the first time D.C. ever contributed electors to the Electoral College, um, those those electors almost invariably go 100% toward the Democratic candidate, right? Like, D.C. is one of the first states that gets called on like those electoral maps during every presidential election. Right. And they go towards the Democrat. So if you made D.C. a state, that's not going to be a huge change. Like nothing's going to change. You're, they're still going to have their three electoral votes and they're probably going to go toward the Democratic candidate for president. They're only going to have one congressperson and that one congressperson will probably be a Democrat, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket when you're talking about like 430 or 60. I can't remember however many are in the House right now. 
Mm-hmm. But when you talk about the Senate, yeah, now the we get to the problem, the partisan political problem with why D.C. is not a state. Because D.C. is and has been for a very long time majority black uh, as far as the population goes and as far as their voting base goes. Traditionally, black voters lean Democrat. That's as far as voting history goes. Uh, that's typically the case for the last several decades at least. Mm-hmm. And if you have two new senators that just did not exist before, the Senate would go from 100 senators to 102 senators, and those two senators were almost guaranteed to be Democratic senators. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine what two extra Democrat senators would do right now if you had two more Democrats in the Senate than what we have. (laughs) That's a funny number right now. (laughs) Now we've reached, exactly, now we've reached the reason why D.C. is not being allowed to be a state and why it's a partisan political matter. Right. And here is where you're going to get into, um, to me, some very disingenuous arguments uh, that are just, it'd be so much easier if they just talked about what the reality was Mm -hmm. instead of disingenuous arguments that everybody knows isn't the real reason. Uh, It's just that that's the stuff I hate about politics in this country is no one's talking about what what the real situation is. Um, You know, some people, they'll try and call it out, but they, uh, so there are sort of two avenues that have been bandied about over the years is uh, basically the two, two main paths Mm -hmm. for uh, making DC a state. And one is what you, what we need to do is uh, the idea is that what we need to do is shrink what is called the, the federal district to only the buildings that are under federal control, like the White House and the Capitol building Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of everything there in D.C., all the all the government buildings, basically, and just make it that. Um, but no, no one lives there except for, you know, no one lives in these buildings. These are office buildings except for the White House mm-hmm. where the president and first family live and maybe some of the staff. So one of the disingenuous arguments that comes up is, well, we can't have a situation where there's only three or four people, like, let's say, living in these places – that get this kind of representation. Right, like three electoral votes. Yeah, that's completely disingenuous. Sure, and especially if that that president is in, an incumbent running for election again, then that incumbent president would have three electoral votes to cast for themselves. Right? So, right. So uh, on paper, you're like, oh, yeah, I could see that being a problem. Let's just give up because of the 23 Amendment and that quirk that it attributed, Right. But there are a lot of, like, workarounds, too, that people are like, no, that's that's a ridiculous argument. Right. Like, uh, the president could, in, in fact, usually does vote uh, absentee from their own home state. Mm-hmm. That's, that's one. And then so if no electoral votes are cast or if no votes are actually cast in the District of Columbia, then you there's no electors to be given, right? So you'd have those three electors that just never didn't go to anybody. That's one, that's one solution. right. right. Um, another one is to just take those three electors and give them to whoever wins the popular vote, regardless. Yeah. And then a lot of people are like, no, you just repeal the 23rd Amendment if you make D.C. a state. Like, it's a one-two punch. Like, they, that's just how it has to be. That's right. And we'll talk more about some some disingenuous arguments and, and deconstruct them as we go. But that's the one that seems to be bandied about most most commonly, right? Yeah. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about why it matters to begin with. Um We mentioned at the very beginning their license plate, taxation without representation. And, you know, that's a a little bit of a snide license plate, but it's very true. They pay federal income tax and like really high federal income tax, so much so that they contribute more than they receive from the federal government. One thing I saw, Chuck, is like, I was like, well, wait a minute, can D.C. like even handle being a state? You know, how much does it get from the federal government? And apparently it is not uh, in any way, shape, or form, the the um, state that re- or the area that receives the most federal funding, I guess that honor goes to Mississippi. Thirty five percent of Mississippi's state and local budget is made up of federal funds. Thirty four percent for Louisiana, New Mexico, and South Dakota. Twenty seven percent. DC's is twenty five percent. So just okay, a quarter so of all of the money. Yeah that D.C. uses to operate comes from the federal government. The rest is from local taxes. And D.C. apparently has a uh, little bonnet, a uh, little flower in its bonnet in that it typically has a balanced budget every year, too. Oh, really? hmm So, it yeah. could do just fine without um, being a state. 
it would be like, yeah, we should still get the federal funding because other states get federal funding too. But even if you kept it at the federal funding they get now, they would be doing just fine. Uh, as far as federal law is concerned, they are treated as a state, yet they're not a state with representation like a state. Mm-hmm. Uh, we already talked about congressional representation. Uh, they, you know, they can't vote on bills. It's, uh, it's really weird that you can introduce a bill and write the bill but not vote in that bill. Yeah, and because constitutional amendments are typically what's thrown around about making D.C. a state or not, or has been up until recently, um, it's kind of ironic that D.C. wouldn't be able to vote on its own ratification, like its own right. statehood, like because it cannot vote on constitutional amendments because it's not a state. So it would it, basically D.C. has to rely on everybody else to go to bat for it because it doesn't have self-determination. That's right. You want to take another break and then talk about some of the arguments for and against? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to do just that, everybody. Burning stuff with Joshua and Charles. Stuff you should know. <laughs> All right, so we've, you know, made our position clear that most of the arguments against statehood are, uh, and these aren't our arguments. I mean, like I said, any honest person will tell you that it is a strictly partisan political issue. Yeah. It's because they don't want two more Democratic senators in there. That's Yeah. Uh, they just don't. And, um, you know, uh, that's their right to to fight against that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and they and they do, but it's disingenuous. And it's an anti-social sentiment. Like there, how somebody or some group of people are expected to vote has like nothing to do with whether they should have the right to vote or not. You yeah. can't just keep people from voting because you don't like the way they're going to vote. That is an anti-social act. Anti-democratic. Yeah, it's both. And you, that's exactly what's going on right now. That is, ex- that's it. They boil it down. I mean, get mad at us just like you did at our gerrymandering episode or our voter suppression episode. It's still the case. That's just how it is right now. It's one of those political fictions that it's anything but that. That's right. Um, the One of the arguments is that it's unconstitutional to begin with. That's why you said that uh, up until recently, most of the attempts to make D.C. a state have uh, tried to come via constitutional uh, uh, amendments. And here's the thing, though. Like, there's nothing specifically prohibiting D.C. from becoming a state in the Constitution. No, you had mentioned that, like, some some people are like, let's shrink D.C., the capital, down to just the federal buildings. Basically, as Ed, who helped us out with this one, um, puts it like tourist D.C., right? Yeah. And that everything else, the commercial and residential D.C., that would become the state. And then that federal district would become the capital. And people are like, no, 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 you can't do that. There's like a size requirement in the, in the Constitution. Can't change something like that. And, and people are saying, well, actually, there is a size requirement. It's a maximum, not a minimum. It doesn't say how small it can be. It says how big it can be. It can't be more yeah. than 10 miles square. Or, yeah, I think 10 square miles. Yes, 10 square miles. Uh, yeah. So, it, yes, you totally could shrink it. So, we just shot down that argument. <laughs> but, but one more thing, Chuck, about that. One of the reasons why they have abandoned a constitutional amendment making D.C. a state is twofold. One— that's a huge hurdle to, to jump over. I think you have to have two-thirds of the state to ratify. Yeah. That comes, some, yeah. So, first of all, you have to get it through both houses of Congress, which is an mm-hmm. impossibility to begin with. And then you have to have two-thirds of the state, many of which are controlled by Republican legislatures, to ratify that amendment to make D.C. a state. So, it's just too huge of a, 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 an obstacle to surmount. But also, it's really disingenuous to require a constitutional amendment to make D.C. a state, because since the Constitution itself was ratified in 1788, not a single state that was admitted into the Union from that time yeah. had had was was admitted through a constitutional amendment. There are no constitutional amendments that that have admitted states. They've all come in through con- congressional decree instead. That's right, and. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second in more detail. But uh, another one of the paths that has been bandied about a little bit is uh, 
um, well, not past the statehood, but past to to making it not a state and mm-hmm. ensuring it never becomes a state. Mm-hmm. Saying, well, why don't we just make it part of Virginia or Maryland, uh, like it used to be? Give it back to them. And nobody, you know, you know who doesn't want that? D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. Yeah, N- none of them want it. Maryland doesn't want to assume those seven hundred thousand people. Virginia doesn't want it. D.C. doesn't want to be a part of either one of those. Right. Like the only people that want that are are frankly Republicans who don't want it to become state. Yes, because it might add a few more electoral votes to Maryland or Virginia, but it would not add a single extra senator. You can't have more than two senators no matter what your population size. Again, the crux to the matter. Yeah. Um, Another one is that the idea that the city can't take care of that federal property. And I don't think anybody who's a um, pro-statehood advocate uh, says, oh, yeah, yeah, they can. That's just not true. But they say, well, we wouldn't be taking care of most of that property. It would be shrunk down to be the capital, so it'd still be the federal government's jurisdiction. And people say, well, there's other federal buildings outside of this little tourist area. How, what are you going to do about those? And D.C. says, do you know how many states and cities have federal yeah. buildings in them that the state and the city takes care of in conjunction with the federal government and with funding from the federal government? Yeah, not a problem. Totally not a problem. I think disingenuity... Is that a word? It is now, buddy. Is one of my least favorite things yeah. to witness. It, it is. Because it's, dis- it's just dishonest. It's just a bunch of garbage, like acting a certain, like, just call it what it is. It's so frustrating. It's almost, almost disingenuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, you mentioned earlier that no other state needed a congressional, or I'm sorry, a, a constitutional amendment mm-hmm. to become a state. Um, the Tennessee model is sort of where D.C. has tried to go more recently. Uh, the Tennessee plan in 1796, when Tennessee wasn't a state yet, and they said, you know what? We're tired of waiting around for Congress to do anything about it. So we're going to hold our own referendum. We're going to vote to become a state. Mm-hmm. And we passed it. And then we're going to write and approve uh, our own state constitution and how we're going to administer that and kind of this is how we would do things. Mm-hmm. And they did that. And then Congress is sort of like everyone's sort of sitting sitting there twiddling their thumbs, staring at Congress <laughs> like we're all ready to go. Just unlock the door and we could become a state. And it worked. And it also worked in Michigan, Iowa, California, Oregon, Kansas, and Alaska. And so D.C. recently, uh, I think about five years ago, mm-hmm. said, maybe let's try this Tennessee plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, forget constitutional amendments. Let's just have a referendum. And it passed by 85%. And they said, great, let's draft a constitution. And they did that. And it was approved. Mm-hmm. And they said the mayor's going to become the governor. City council will become the legislature. Mm-hmm. And here we go, Congress. Let's get this done. We're ready to roll. Yeah. And I so this was in 2016 that that referendum passed and they started to adopt the Tennessee plan. And what sucks, Chuck, is that means that they were distracted by that idea that they had to become a state through constitutional amendment for decades. Yeah. Like they, if they'd taken up this Tennessee plan decades ago, who knows where they would be now? They might be a state by now. It's just so, it's just, it's really sad to, to think like that, that, that work, that boondoggle work that they needed for to For a be. couple of hundred plus years. Yeah, basically. So that's why I'm like, I don't know. We might actually see, it's possible we could see D.C. a state um, because be, this referendum and the, the plan that they followed where they basically made themselves an instant state, like just add Congress kind of thing. Um, it came in, in just the last five years. So it, for the first time ever, in the history of the District of Columbia, um, a bill passed that says D.C. is a state. Please go ahead and, and um, pass this bill, Senate. It passed the House. Everything else has been like, we're the House of Representatives, and we think D.C. should be a state. Not a, It's just a, like a, a resolution in support of D.C. being a state. It's not an actual law. This is an actual law that passed the House of Representatives. Of course, it died in the Senate because um, it was while Mitch McConnell was a majority leader, and he didn't even let it come up for a vote. I, I can't believe it even made it onto his desk before catching fire. But... <laughs> But it, the fact is that it did pass the House at least once, and that is brand yeah. new. That is definitely new. Yeah, in 2020. It's amazing. And uh, it's amazing that we have a situation in our in our modern-day government where one person can say, no, nah, we're not going to vote on this. Two-party system does not work. It, it's broken. It doesn't work. 
Yeah, it was reintroduced in 2021, just this year, passed the House again. Um, well, it, it, sadly, in this case, it, it's probably not going to happen because Democrats can't agree on anything. Yes, this uh, within is their own party. Terrible irony of the whole thing, isn't it? Yes, it really is. Uh, you mentioned two people earlier. Probably would be those same two people. That's to what keep I this saw from happening. Yeah, the only other um, question mark is Mark Kelly. No, Angus King from Maine. Oh, really? And he may be retired now. But yes, I, it's from what I saw, it would come down to Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin, and um, both have not supported previous like DC statehood stuff before. Other people who have not actually didn't actually co-sponsor that bill in the Senate. Um, have supported other stuff, so they would be expected to, to, to vote yes. So it could come down to two people, again, both of whom dem- Democrats, that would keep D.C. from becoming a state now. It's pretty interesting stuff. What would uh, I've heard different names bandied about over the years if it did become a state. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew that New Columbia was what they were going to call it for a long time, uh, but then, you know, uh, in more recent years, Christopher Columbus has become mm-hmm. less favorable mm-hmm. in in the eyes of history. Mm-hmm. So they're saying maybe New Columbia is not the right uh, the right name after all. No, and I didn't know this, but they um, they are they plan as part of that referendum um, draft constitution that was passed. Uh, they would change the name. They would keep it as Washington D.C., but D.C. would stand for Douglas Commonwealth after Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, former slave. I like it. Isn't that neat? Yeah, D.C., you know, I think people that go to tourist D.C., which is a lot of fun. We've both done that that thing a lot of times. Um, it is that, but D.C. is a rich city with a rich history mm-hmm. uh, in and of itself, a rich history of music and culture and black culture and uh, great food. And, like, there's a, there's a lot to D.C. besides the mall area. Oh, yeah. Um, and every time I go there... I try to check out different areas and do different things, and uh, it's it's awesome. We have a, a great, great time when we do live shows in D.C. It's Every one of my time. favorite places when we go to, uh, what is it, um, Lincoln? Lincoln. Mm-hmm. And they give us those Lincoln logs, the <laughs> the pastry. Where yeah. do those come from? What do you mean where they come from? What's the, what's the bakery that does those? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's I in nearby terrible that I don't know bakery that. on U Street. I don't they're remember. They're always but just yeah. sitting there backstage, and they're I, uh, so delicious. And we always eat like ten each of them. They're they're like Swiss cake rolls, but like the bakery version of a Swiss cake roll. Yeah. So before we go, Chuck, I feel like we have to talk about how some recent events, like really, kind of have brought the idea of DC not being a state to the fore. Um, both of which occurred in 2020, actually. Oh, like the storming of the Capitol. That's that's one of them for sure. Yeah, and I, th- I think that kind of harkens back to the mutiny of 1783, mm-hmm. and that uh, there there are some people who think it could it would have gone down a lot differently if um, we had been able if if the government had been able to call on um, the state national guard like super quickly. Yeah, because the national guard, the D.C. national guard, is not under control of D.C. Just like any other state's national guard would be under the state's control, which is why. That that's what Congress wanted it to be like. They wanted D.C.'s National Guard to be under control of the federal government because of that that mutiny of 1783. But the exact opposite thing happened mm-hmm. on January 6th because D.C. and the Capitol wanted the D.C. National Guard and definitely would have activated them and brought them out hours before. But the federal government at the time kept them from doing that because they were under federal control. So that was one that really just kind of pointed out like, oh, well, this is harmful. This is not good. Um, The other way that it was pointed out was kind of the opposite of that, where during the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd um, and people took to the streets in D.C., they um, they were basically beaten out of the streets, harassed out of the streets, used tear gas on um, by the D.C. National Guard that was deployed by the federal government. Whereas you can pretty much guess that if Muriel Bowser had been the governor of the state of D.C. rather than just the mayor and had the power over the National Guard, those National Guard troops would not have been deployed against those protesters. So both of those events, just within months of one another. um, So the the protests were in 2020. The insurrection was in the beginning of 2021. 
Yeah, that was this year. <laughs> it's nuts it, to think it of. It seems really, I thought 2020 was long. 2021 seems longer. This year's been a long decade, you know? It, <laughs> but both really of does. those both of those events have pointed out, like, because of that mutiny of 1783, those things were able to happen the way that they did. Really, really interesting. Yeah, it is. So now you guys know, D.C. statehood. You make up your own mind about it, but them's the facts. Uh, them's the facts. And since I said them's the facts, it's time, of course, everybody, for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, baby shout-out. We don't do a lot of shout-outs, but this is kind of special, I think, uh, because this is a future shout-out. Okay. Uh, I've been a long-time listener, uh, and in January 2020, I had a baby. Who's your youngest listener? While I was pregnant, I worked as an assistant manager at a local horse boarding facility near Augusta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And every morning when I fed the horses, I put my phone uh, in my phone belt and turned on Stuff You Should Know. Uh, babies can hear nearby sounds in the womb. And so Clara has been listening as long as she's been able to hear. Uh, now we listen to Stuff You Should Know during our afternoon walks together. If an episode finishes before it's over, Clara will sign and ask for more. You know, that little toddler sign language is the best. I know, it's adorable. I didn't realize it was the thing, and then one of Yumi's best friends um, taught her kids, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Yeah, we did some basic stuff. We didn't get too involved, but there was a little bit of that early on. Man, kids are so neat these days. They're so neat. Uh, not like us. We were just dummies. Yeah. They're like, here, here's oatmeal and a television. We played with a <laughs> stick and a wheel. <laughs> uh, back to the mail. I would love for her to have a shout-out on an episode, so one day... We can go back and listen to her episode. Cute. So, uh, Clara, your episode is on DC statehood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe things will be different then. Yeah, wouldn't that be something? That would be something. Uh, but this is from Karis Texador, and she just says, Thanks uh, for all we do. We really help fill the long hours of COVID shutdown at home with an infant and for helping making learning new things fun. That is Karis Texador. Great name. That's awesome. Thanks, Karis. Definitely a great name. You sound like the last starfighter or something. That's right. And hello, little Carla. I uh, hope you keep listening. And uh, I hope by the time you're 20, uh, we're still doing this show. No, maybe not by then. <laughs> Recently retired. Yeah, I'll be 70. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much for writing in. Karis and Carla, best wishes to you on a fantastic life. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with us like Karis and Carla did, you can send us an email to stuff podcast at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts my iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.